And thank you again. And now I will turn it over to our NHGRI Director, Eric Green, to introduce the first panel for our symposium. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Larry, for introducing today's events. And uh, welcome to all of you, both in the auditorium and also those of many of you who are joining us remotely. So I want to now um, transition to the next thing we're going to do, which um, was our interest in really highlighting um, the fact that uh, in the last 20 years, since the end of the Human Genome Project, uh, there's just been profound um, changes in genomics with respect to how it has seeped and spread across the entire landscape of biomedical research. And we thought one way to sort of tease that out and really discuss it would be to uh, bring together a group of other um, institute center program directors here at NIH, and particularly those overseeing programs that have a significant um, engagement around genetics and genomics to hear from them about a number of things, historical, sort of past, also the president, even thinking about the future, how it's influencing their areas. And so they're going to join me up on stage. I'm going to sit over there with them a second for this you know, Human Genome Project to 2023, how genomics research has really spread across the NIH. And so we have uh, four of my good friends and colleagues joining us. We have Diana Bianchi, who's the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Josh Denny, who's the CEO of the All of Us Research Program. Gary Gibbons, who is the director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And Joni Rutter, who is the director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. So if you will, please come join me up on stage, and I will join you as well. Well, first thing is, um, and this is not on my uh, prepared ideas, uh, first thing is uh, um, those who came with props. Gary Gibbons brought his name with two Gs, <laughs> Gary Gibbons, and his middle name is Genomics, so that's good enough for Gary. Um, but, but, but Joni, I saw you brought, uh, this was, this is, you brought two props, actually. We're starting with the three props, overachiever. No, but then you're, you're four. four. Okay, show us your props. Microphone, thank you. Um, my props are from uh, 20, uh, tw 2001, in, in February 15th. There were two articles, one February 15th, one February 16th. And uh, this is the sequencing of the human genome. Uh, this is the Nature uh, Journal that was published from, uh, from a lot of the work that was done here on the NIH campus from many of the people that you're going to hear from today. And then the other one is the, the science article that was done as well, and you can see the differences in the covers. Uh, one is a, a mosaic of, of people's faces on the nature cover, which is the one I prefer. And then the other one is, of course, uh, uh, several faces that are in the shape of, of DNA. And then the, the third one is the, uh, the nature article from 50 years ago of celebrating the, the DNA day. So uh, if you're interested in taking a look, I'm happy to share them and show them to you after the, after the panel. And then finally, my, my last, is the scarf of, of DNA, and uh, perhaps it's it's something that we share, Diana. Uh, so over to you. Gibbons and I have scarf envy, like big time. But okay, just saying. <laughs> you don't, nobody brings us scarves like that. Okay. Um, second second thing is, what, what folks up in the remote or, or virtual or in the, what you can't tell is that what's so funny about Joni's journals is that. She has in black magic marker written, you know, rudder. Like there was just no way anybody's going to steal that from her. It came in the mail, and she put the black permanent ink. This is mine. Do not. So she said you could look at it, but believe me, she's not going to let you t walk away with it. Some people in the audience have never seen a paper journal. That's, and then there's that. And, then, and you actually care on the cover. That's right. There's actually covers, and yeah, no, it's true. Okay. So Diane. Well, yes, I wore my DNA scarf really to acknowledge the fact that certainly DNA is the most important molecule in life, but it's also an icon. It's an artistic symbol as well, and it's quite beautiful. And if you visit me in my office at NICHD, you'll see I have also have a painting of the DNA molecule that I bought on Etsy. And I didn't wear my jewelry, my DNA jewelry today, because that would be over the top. But, okay. but Joni is yes. wearing hers. <laughs> and then Josh. All right. 
Last but not least, and you gotta go yep. low. So I'm, I'm uh, wearing, you know, I guess two props, one on each foot. So yes, I'm wearing my DNA socks. One of my pairs of DNA socks, actually. I, I could have actually worn a different sock on each foot. That would have, but that would have been overkill. I thought you would have thought that was non-purposeful. That was a um, mismatch. Knowing me, you would have thought that would have, yeah, that would have been mismatch. Good point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So let's let's get into the discussion. I'm going to start with think back. October 1, 1990, the day the Human Genome Project began. What were you doing, and were you aware that the Genome Project was starting? We're going to start with you. Um, so by, by disclosure, I'm, I'm probably the least genetic genomicist uh, of the panel. So uh, I must admit, uh, in 1990, I probably had just uh, joined the faculty at Stanford having left my, my fellowship at, at, at Harvard. Uh, so it was my first assistant professor job. Uh, and really, for me, that period was the explosion just of molecular biology in general, uh, PCR and so forth, and the, the ability as a clinician scientist to think that, you know, we might be able to understand the molecular basis of a lot of diseases. Uh, I was uh, uh, interested in, in hypertension, uh, and in particular, why certain groups African Americans uh, have hypertension, uh, so I was interested in vascular disease and blood pressure. This fact, a uh, system called renal angiotensin system. Long story short, um, that was also in Stanford a ferment where you had companies like Genentech leveraging recombinant technology for therapeutics. Uh, it was obviously Silicon Valley where people were thinking about chips, and so I still remember those days when. You know, you're thinking about that intersection of molecular biology and chips. And so, you know, that, those are the days affymetrics and so forth were coming along. So it, it wasn't necessarily the sequencing of the genome per se, but that notion that we were developing the technologies. Uh, when you, were you aware of the Genome Project when it started? I mean, did, just sort of was something being talked about? Yeah, just something. Did, did you formulated an opinion or you yeah, were sort no, of no, something in the atmosphere, yeah. Okay. Johnny, okay. where were you on October 1, 1990? I was, I was a, my third year in college, um, and I was, I was a biology major, and my professor was big into genetics. And because of that, uh, and Tom Check had just won the Nobel Prize, uh, things were exciting in, in RNA biology, DNA biology. Um, because of that, I got really interested, and um, after, after college, shortly thereafter, I went to uh, work in Boston as a, as a research technician in a lab that was working on chromosome 22 for the Human Genome Project. So I, uh, that, that's, that's where I started was chromosome 22. It's one of the smaller ones because it matches my height, but um, it was a very exciting chromosome, I thought. So uh, that's my foray into. Okay. And Diana, as the only card-carrying true medical geneticist on this panel, human geneticist, I have a feeling your answer is going to be a little different. Of course I was aware of the Human Genome Project. Um, so on October 1st, 1990, I was an instructor at Harvard Medical School and an attending at Boston Children's. They call them pretendings because you're so low on the, on the academic ladder. Um, but as a medical geneticist, someone who had been doing cytogenetics research from high school onwards, and as a member of the American Society of Human Genetics, I had been hearing about the Human Genome Project. But from a personal perspective, it just seemed very remote. It seemed like something that was going to require a lot of resources, big time equipment. It was something that as a very junior faculty member, I mean, I was lucky I got the second PCR machine at Boston Children's. That was my idea of big time equipment. Actually, before then I was manually doing PCR. So the idea of having, you know, a giant machine that could be capable of sequencing DNA was way beyond my pay grade. But I was following it through the American Society of Human Genetics. So, so, so far, sort of agnostic, sort of excited, a little threatened, right? I, mean, you I were wasn't about threatened. Well, not threatened, no. but you thought it was big. It was, it was, you know, it was <laughs> I wasn't threatened. Threaten. I okay. was following with interest, okay. but knowing that you know, this was beyond anything I you could or imagine. my laboratory would be capable of doing. Okay. Josh? I'll be the unaware one. 
I was a freshman in high school. Somehow Jody is still younger than me. Yeah. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, so I was. Uh, uh, but you know, it's interesting. I, so I was unaware of the Human Genome Project. I had some really wonderful science teachers that uh, really helped cultivate a love of science and genetics and computer science from uh, my high school days. And I remember my biology teacher had a picture of Watson and Crick and had us watch the race for the double helix. And um, uh, you know, it's which is really hard to find, by the way, if you want to show it to your kids, as I have tried to. Um, the um, uh, you know she just cultivated that kind of science. I know she would be. She has since passed away, but she would have been absolutely thrilled with where we are now, for sure. All right. So then, fast forward. So we're going to fast forward th thirteen years later. So now this takes us back twenty years ago, literally to the month. So April two thousand three, the Genome Project ended. Um, did you were, were you more aware of the Genome Project? Had it started to seep into your professional life, and had your opinion about it changed? Um, in, you know, good, bad, and different. Start with you. All right. So this is now 2020. No, no 2003. 2003. Oh, 20 I see. Ago. Oh, I see. I see. Now the end of the project. Okay, now the end of the project. Yeah. So uh, at that point, um, uh, I was at the Morehouse School of Medicine, actually, uh, and so I was uh, founding director of this uh, cardiovascular research institute. Uh, and uh, you probably, I don't even know if you remember, uh, but we invited Francis to Morehouse, um, and we had this insane idea, I'm sure he figured it was insane, uh, that, that Morehouse should be at the lead of trying to get this intersection of all the patients that we were seeing, serving the underserved, which is what it did, um, and linking that to uh, actually, electronic health records, uh, uh, Josh, uh, from Grady Hospital, which is one of the biggest public hospitals uh, in the country, uh, and to uh, use that as a, a, a create a biobank uh, for genomics uh, at that point and understand that hopefully the interaction of the social factors and genes and health disparities. So that's what I was doing in 2003, obviously trying to leverage. The HGP. So you become a fan? I mean, you went from being agnostic, now you're a fan. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. All right. Okay, so I, I became totally bought in uh, after working on chromosome 22. Then I went to um, graduate school in a program on pharmacology and toxicology. And I, during my interview, people asked me why I wanted to go into pharmacology and toxicology. And I said, well, I've been doing a lot of human genetics. And I want to know, I want to prepare myself for how to think about where we can move human genetics into treatments and therapeutics. And so I was trying to already look beyond. But in 2001, 2003, 2003, is what 2003 um, I was here at the, at the NIH campus. I was a, a fellow in, at, at the National Cancer Institute working on BRCA1, BRCA2, and uh, a melanoma gene called P16, uh, chromosomes 17, 13, 17, and then 9. I think I, I, think I got that right. Um, BRCA1, BRCA2, and, and then P16. And um, I, what, what I found remarkable was that, for example, for the, for the breast and ovarian cancer genes, BRCA1 and 2, there are three founder mutations in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And some of the people in this room have worked on this as well. But what was fascinating to me is that people were in families with the same exact genetic mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2. We had families with the same exact genetic mutation, but they often had different cancer types. So I was very interested in, in the intersection between genes and environment and how the interplay might manifest in different ways for how uh, the, the genetic mutations might, um, might, might come to be in a person uh, with a particular disease, in this case, breast or ovarian cancer and male breast cancer as well. And so I spent a lot of my time working on, on that particular gene, trying to understand why it would manifest differently um, in that gene and environment interplay. So by 2003, I was an endowed professor at Tufts University School of Medicine in Pediatrics and Obstetrics. And my lifelong uh, career goals have been to use genetics and then genomics 
to advance the health of babies. But by 2003, we were already using uh, genomics for clinical testing. So I remember in 1997, we had already begun to use um, genetic and genomic testing for BRCA1 and 2. But it was in the very early stages, so quite frequently we would get variants of unknown significance. And that was really difficult. I mean, if someone had no variants and had essentially a normal result, that was easy to explain. And if someone had the mutation, then that was also easy to explain, and then we would uh, manage them accordingly. Um, but there were also all kinds of issues related to getting insurance coverage for some of this testing at the early days. And we were beginning to do some testing in neonates with birth defects. We hadn't quite yet moved to using it prenatally. So I, I went from being a fan thinking, oh, well, this is, you know, this is so far in the future. This is something that's not really going to going to affect my professional practice or my research to, in a very short time, you know, suddenly we're incorporating it into care, and we've seen this arc from basic science to the patient. And I was finishing medical school. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> so I was aware of genomics. I do remember some of the seminal announcements and uh, was aware of those publications, Joni, um, uh, as they came out and, and some of the large posters that came out, you know, related to them. Uh, but interestingly, uh, some of the foundation that would come relevant to me getting into genomics was being laid as I'd built, a, um, with some others, a natural language processing system at Vanderbilt um, to pull together and mine all the education curriculum, which actually involved digitization of a lot of typed hundreds of pages of like typewriter typed documents actually um, in, in, in addition to stuff that was in like Word and PowerPoint um, and WordPerfect if you remember those. Um, and, and so we, uh, <laughs> so we had all these things pulled together. And uh, this technology allowed us to look at broad concepts too. And so interestingly, we looked at four broad concepts across the curriculum were some of the early test cases for this to do something other than just find that lecture on, you know, um, an ACL tear or, you know, a congestive heart failure. We looked at four broad topics and one of them ended up being genetics where you had to explode that concept into a lot of topics. And amongst those four topics, after looking at genetics in the curriculum, we actually created a genetics course. And that was actually in 2003. So I thought, you know, that was um, uh, interesting timing um, uh, of all that. So, so you wrote this software as a medical student? Uh, yeah, so I took a year off between third and fourth year. And so I, I did a lot of computer science when I was in, in high school. and, and uh, and, and college. Um, Is that his so. Yeah, it's something. I, you know, it's like I, I, Gary and I were just trying to hang on during medical school, and somehow you were writing code. I don't understand how that is, but okay. Well, we'll just leave that alone. So, the the reason we chose these four individuals first. So now you've been introduced and we a little bit of history. You were chosen. I we chose. I Oh, just, I don't pick directors' names out of a hat and just assume they do genomics, although I probably could, but that'd be a little arrogant to believe that everybody would be. No, no, you, we specifically wanted to showcase um, different parts of NIH, um, including uh, two institutes, a center, and a program, because they each have different um, um, ways of which genomics has had an influence on, on the work that is done at each of your um, entities. So, so there's method to the madness. There is, absolutely, always okay. is. Okay. Always okay. is okay. method to the madness, especially when it involves our institute, because we're mad, we're crazy. <laughs> um, any case, so what I want to hear from, but we're going to start with Gary, is, is sort of your perspective, I mean, as the director, of wh what you've seen during your time as director, how genomics has influenced sort of what, what Heart, Lung, and Blood is doing as a research enterprise. Um, so, at first, I guess I'm obliged as our host to point out, uh, you know, the collaborative partnership uh, with Genome. Uh, certainly, uh, I think there was an opportunity to start to take on from the Mendelian sort of uh, strategies, uh, these complex traits, and certainly uh, for our portfolio of heart, lung, blood, uh, and sleep disorders, this was something that was timely for us, uh, we thought. Um, and um, we were encouraged by uh, some of the advances obviously have been made uh, 
LDL cholesterol, Goldstein Brown, uh, the uh, uh, things that uh, Rick Lifton was doing, hypertension and finding those uh, monogenic uh, forms in their molecular basis. Uh, so we're starting to understand how uh, it was unlocking understandings of lipid metabolism and its role in disease, uh, hypertension, et cetera. So it, it seemed uh, a logical thing at, at this, that this last 10 years to start to do that at scale that leveraged uh, the legacy of our cohort studies uh, that we've had. And so that was started the things that engendered uh, um, top med uh, and, and now by uh, Data Catalyst, and uh, you at the same time were doing uh, Anvil and uh, the CCGB, uh, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, and, and we're doing complex traits with us, like asthma, uh, et cetera. So uh, in many ways, it's informed, I think, one of the, the, the major programs we now have in precision medicine uh, and set up that, that uh, apparatus. So, and Diane, you became director of an institute, even after Gary? And, yes. But child health, obviously, a lot of opportunities in genetics and genomics. What have you seen both before you started, but since the, you know, since the Genome Project ended 20 years ago, and especially now, what's going on? Well, um, I started on Election Day in 2016, a mo momentous day. And um, one of the reasons why I was interested in applying for the position of director of NICHD was I felt like they could do a lot more in terms of genomics, um, that they, you know, had been a little bit slow and a little bit more traditional than I thought the field deserved. So as Eric can attest, one of the very first things I did when I started was to figure out how we can build bridges between our institutes. And um, that has resulted in two major prog projects, one of which is related to um, uh, annotation in terms of uh, developmental gene expression. So if you look at many of the databases, there's very little that's annotated for the placenta, for the fetus, or the young infant and child. So that was one major project that we're co-funding. And then another project that we're co-funding is really looking at the genomic basis uh, for couples who have lost more than one pregnancy. So the, the current medical management is to do cytogenetic studies or chromosome microarray studies, but not really get at it from the genomic level. So that's been a very fruitful partnership. Also, nobody's mentioned the fact that three of us have intramural laboratories in genome. And so we are, you know, because directors cannot have a laboratory in the institute that they direct because of conflict of interest reasons. Um, so we are not only, we not only have an, our own institute or center perspective, but we have our own laboratories perspectives as well. So Eric's our landlord. <laughs> I'm a good landlord. Um, so Joni, we want to help us um, understand, let me tell some history and then I'm going to ask you to explain. But there was an opportunity that started to come out shortly after the Genome Project ended that would intersect sort of chemical biology and genomics. And of course, there was a pilot effort that got started within NHGRI's intramural program in chemical genomics, the phrase of chemical genomics. That eventually was so successful, it, as I refer to it, was sort of butted out of NHGRI and became its own entity, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which now you are now the second director. So maybe you could explain the history of creating NCATS, which is the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, and how genomics continues to influences, influence NCAT's mission since its creation. Yeah, and um, you know, I think we have, we have NHGRI to thank for that. So if NHGRI was a yeast, we would be a budding yeast, <laughs> 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 blebbing off the, the yeast cell um, and, and creating the uh, NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. It, it, it was born really from the Human Genome Project because as Eric mentioned, the uh, s sort of the idea of chemical genomics or, or chemical gen genomics is the idea of now we know about the human genome uh, uh, and, and genes within the human genome. We need to now understand what their function is. And so the chemical genomics libraries were created or uh, one of the first programs out of the roadmap and what's, what's known now as the common front program is the molecular libraries program uh, in 2004. 
And that was, that was started, it was initiated to really help us understand and explore the functionality of the human genome by identifying particular uh, chemical entities that might interact with genes and, and the protein products from those genes to understand how they worked. And so they were called chemical probes. And sometimes chemical probes become medications, um, ultimately, if they can uh, go through the drug development pipeline and, and become compounds for um, uh, investigational new drugs and go into clinical trials and then actually do have some sort of effect on particular proteins that can help uh, mitigate disease or, or risk for disease. So, so that's what the, the, chemical pro, the chemical libraries program was all about in the chemical genomics program. And ultimately, it started at, at NHGRI, and then once NCATS was created um, in 2000, very end of 2011, early 2012, um, NCATS was created in a way to help bring uh, basic findings into more clinical applications and uh, develop that sort of translational pipeline to pull these types of uh, uh, these types of probes or compounds through. And ultimately, NCATS was generated to be this sort of area that, that sat within the, what we refer to as the, the valley of death and, and that in drug development. Um, oftentimes, basic science findings move into drug development uh, phase, but they often fail during that phase. And so NCATS was created to help identify why things failed in that phase and to help pull them through the translational science pipeline and into more clinical practice. And, and uh, today, we now have this molecular libraries program that is over 370,000 compounds within our library that we screen, uh, millions of screens per year, uh, and it's still growing strong. So thanks to NHGRI, we're, we're doing well. So I hope people can appreciate, you know, even the first three um, explanations they heard, you know, see how genomics becomes a major part of heart, lung, and blood research writ large, child health and development research writ large, and then you even see how genomics found its way into a whole new field, in some ways, chemical biology intersection, chemical genomics. Similarly, going to Josh Denny, similarly, genomics accelerated and greatly amplified and gave new dimensionality, if that's even a word, to cohort-based research. So Josh, maybe you could sort of unpack that, explain a little bit about the UK Biobank, about the All of Us Research Program, and really just point out how genomics is just sort of central to much of these activities. Certainly, I mean, I think if you look at the legacy over decades or you know, uh, even 100 years or so, um, you can see really transfa transformational discoveries made from cohort studies. And we think you know, all of us as physicians trained and, and became used to using Framingham risk scores with populations and other sorts of risk scores um, derived from other cohorts. And, you know, fundamental had been collection of biospecimens, delivery of surveys, uh, structured physical exams, things like that to capture data um, and develop uh, risk to identify risk factors that are intervenable for uh, improving health. And as you saw these cohorts uh, begin, and, and Gary, you mentioned the, the story at Morehouse and how um, you uh, began to think about using electronic health records and DNA at that time. Um, you know, we were thinking of similar things at Vanderbilt at the time and, and uh, how we could use the electronic health record and how we could collect biospecimens, in this case, leftover from the common clinical tests um, uh, in the blood that's about to be discarded in order to start to build that library and consent patients to use some of that, just like we thought about electronic health records. And, you know, with the scalable technologies that were developed using genotype arrays and then the dramatic falling of the cost of sequencing, uh, figuring out how to use the electronic health record as a resource for phenotypic data you know, you really started to make possible a the kinds of resources we have seen in more modern times, like the UK Biobank and all of us, and a lot of site-specific biobanks. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. But when you go to the beginning of um, 2015, when we were talking about uh, what was then called the Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program, uh, the, the ones of us working on this, you know, it was a minority opinion to start that electronic health records would be an important part of that uh, resource. And you know now basically every cohort is using either electronic health records or claims data or some sort of this um, uh, you know sort of uh, naturally accrued what we invest you know billions of dollars into our healthcare and all this testing as part of the phenotypic data. 
and with cohorts like the UK Biobank and all of us augmenting that with what we've learned through the many decades of powerful cohort studies, the structured exams, the um, uh, surveys that can give you the kind of information that we don't ask regularly in clinical exams. So, you know, I think all these things came together with dramatic cost uh, falling of the cost of sequencing to make um, and cloud storage, uh, these kinds of things to make it all possible to do these kind of monitored core programs and make them available, not just to a small team of researchers, but to researchers across the world. And I think that open science, which the UK Biobank has really helped pioneer, is really a future that we have so many investigators that can come into these resources, make studies, down to you know those high school students um, uh, that are pioneering, to um, people in individual labs that can you know fire up these um, uh, immense resources and have access to you know make discoveries. By the way, I would include middle schoolers in this. Middle that's schoolers, middle, middle schoolers, schoolers, that's right. Us. It doesn't we, have to be you know, so we, we, that's a great point. We've had a high school, uh, uh, high schooler win an award in the Regeneron Science Fair last year. We need to get a middle schooler on that list too. So, so your prime uh, targets. In so a good I want way. to hear from each of you if you think back on the last 20 years. So now, since the end of the Human Genome Project, what has surprised you the most about genomics? What's the singular thing that has been the most surprising? Anyone? We don't have to do it in order. We can just, what, what immediately comes to your brain, any one of you? Well, you know, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, I had an interest in computer science. And if you had talked to me in high school, I probably would have done something with, you know, I would envision a, a future maybe more with, um, uh, well, I work a lot with computers anyway, but um, uh, not necessarily uh, figuring out how to work with that in health. And so the falling of, you know, uh, uh, price per megabyte or, um, uh, you know, increase in clock cycles, all these things, Moore's Law, right, which many of you have heard of, of that halving or doubling of, originally doubling of, uh, transistors on a, um, uh, you know, a given, for a given price every 18 months, being so blown away by the cost of sequencing. The cost of sequencing fell so dramatically faster than Moore's Law. And I think that is really one of those foundational things that I don't think, in, if you go back to that time, I ever would have expected we could have gotten from billions to hundreds um, uh, in, in such a short period of time. And that's made so many other things possible. Um, I could say a lot, but that's one that really has really hopefully transformed care. Diana? I would say um, the kind of general public's interest in having their genome sequence, you know, such as, you know, Ancestry.com or 23andMe, that those commercial entities have been so successful uh, for good and for bad. I mean, they've been misused in certain ways. They've raised ethical questions with regard to uh, identifying criminals. Um, also, people have found out that they really are not the biologic issue of people they thought they were. Uh, but, but those programs have been enormously successful. So on the one hand, people really do want to know, and there's been a whole shift in identity. You know, people, I, I'll just give you an example. I, I did do Ancestry.com, and I, got a gift for my husband so that he would do it too, and he chickened out, so I gave it to my brother, and I had absolutely no doubt that my brother was my biological brother, but when his result, results came back, I was actually a little nervous because I thought, what if it does show something that we weren't <laughs> expecting, and, and he made a joke out of it, but eventually I got the email, he said, the results show dot, 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 you are 100% my sister, you know, we, we share 50% of our genome. So I think that's really surprised me, the uptake by the public. And I, I'm going to go in a different direction, but I want to just comment on the commercialization because there's also now uh, the All of Us program provides genetic results back. And I just got mine yesterday oh. and opened mine yesterday. And uh, Any surprises? no surprises. Uh, uh, so it was very, very good. But thank you to the All of Us research program. She learned that you're her sister. Yeah, <laughs> her sister. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, my brothers and sisters up here. Uh, so, so I was going to go into to a different direction. I, I think one of the things that has surprised me is is the therapeutic side because that's an, a side that I, I'm interested in. Um, you know, back in the lab, you talked about the PCRs going from water bath, uh, you know, temperatures uh, uh, many times. 
uh, gets very tiring. But and, and the other side, when I was in in uh, as a technician laboratory, I would make TAC polymerase. Uh, so we would create that that as a as a as a product ourselves, and we would use it. But the fact that it would you know it would cut DNA very precisely. And now what we're learning today is those those bacterial enzymes are very powerful tools to use uh, for genome editing, for example. And the possibility of putting the sort of uh, these these uh, tools from bacteria in, the, in a milieu of, of a reagent that can be delivered to your cells to cut a specific base and correct a mutation. The idea of gene editing to me is is really exciting. And, and it's over the past 20 years, I think that we have really been able to see the evolution of that possibility to, to actually now seeing uh, submissions to the FDA for new drug approvals for these types of approaches. So gene therapy, where we're delivering uh, replacement genes for a, for a, uh, uh, for a mutated copy of a gene, we're, we're giving a functional copy of a gene to base editing or prime editing uh, of, a, of a particular base pair within a mutated gene to correct those deficiencies. To me, we're, we're still a long way, I think, for really doing this in a mainstream sort of fashion. But with the idea that there are over 10,000 diseases out there, and most of those are rare diseases, and given that oh, there are over 10,000 rare diseases and 80% of those are monogenic, close to 80% are monogenic, this gives us <clears throat> a very big hope that we can use these technologies to hopefully, in the next decade ahead, perhaps, what we might see is more opportunity for that type of therapeutic intervention. That's exciting. By the way, your TAC polymerase um, story, I, I tried to purify TAC polymerase. I did purify a lot of TAC polymerase during the Genome Project, which, as you know, was illegal. Um, yes. And I, I got the cease and desist letter from the <laughs> university lawyers when they found out about it because we were violating patents. But that's a whole other story. But there's a, there's a, lot, of, um, there's a lot of those war stories from the Human Genome Project. That would be one of them I can certainly tell. Gary, did you have a big uh, I, I, I guess maybe surprise in a, in a different kind of way that maybe more relates to our, our eighth grade uh, stars here that um, I, I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist uh, and when I was in medical school. Uh, and long story short, I uh, uh, approached a f professor of physiology uh, with what I thought was a challenging question as to why African Americans have more hypertension than, than other groups. Uh, and uh, being a good Harvard professor, he turned it around and said, uh, that's a question you should try to answer. Uh, and so my surprise is that as we were talking about creating this resource that uh, would enable us to understand things like people who look like me and grew up in a neighborhood I came up with, I thought, oh, well, let's at least get that genetic component, even if it's not the main thing. Um, what surprised me uh, I think increasingly is understanding how dynamic the other omics are, whether it's our uh, microbiome or our metabolome or our proteome uh, or epigenome uh, that might help us understand how social factors get under the skin, start to modulate systems. So that to me is, is its ability to potentially detect the non uh, ATTG driven parts of a disease, uh, I think also would be cool. So n none of you mentioned what I would, what uh, among the list of things I'd mentioned as a surprise, it, it most directly relates to what Josh was saying about the cost of genome sequencing, but, and maybe it's because of my pathology background as a physician, is if you would have said to me the day the Genome Project ended, within 20 years, we will be routinely sequencing people's genomes as part of a diagnostic workup, especially for rare disease. And the fact that's now done and estimated at least 50 to 100,000 times worldwide every year, and part of it's because the cost is so low, but part of it's because we actually can get something with the results that are meaningful, especially for those on diagnostic odysseys. To me, I never thought that would happen in my lifetime when the Genome Project started. I would have predicted when the Genome Project ended, I wouldn't think it would happen during my professional lifetime. And then the fact that it's happening on my watch is probably one of the most gratifying things of my professional existence. But it's still not easy. You still have to get insurance approval. And so while it is technically feasible, right. it's not always practical. But I never thought it would happen this quick. I yeah. guess that's the point. Not, not that there aren't challenges, not that there aren't barriers, et cetera, et cetera. 
So one thing I want to tell the audience is um, I'm going to keep asking questions, but I'm going to go about another four or five minutes. I'm also happy to yield to some of you if you have questions. So if you do, just go to a microphone. I don't know if there's any online questions. OK, so Roseanne could go up to a microphone and feel free to ask any of the questions. You can do it now if you want. Um, I have a couple of questions I could insert, but I'd be really curious to hear what some of our remote viewers are thinking. Yes, the first question we have is from the Zoom audience. As DNA technology advances at a rapid rate, what do you predict will be the largest bioethical issue where technology is ahead of the law? Ahead of the law. Or if you, don't, if you want to generalize it, what do you think is the biggest bioethical challenge we're going to be facing as we have these surges, but things like payment doesn't catch up, other things don't catch up? What do you think? What, what, well, let, me, let me rephrase the question. We're, we're in this genomic wave, which is both euphoric, but there's some scary elements. In the domains that you work in at your institute, what, what, do, you, what, what do you worry about? with genomics? What's the thing that gives you pause? Well, I, think, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I don't know that we're, I think we've always, technologies always seem to be ahead of policy. Um, and that's just a pervasive thing. And we're still seeing that today. I think with, with we were talking about EHRs, and so I was kind of curious, maybe, maybe uh, Gary and, and Josh can say more about this. But uh, to me, I think we don't, have yet your, well, in some places we do, genome sequence within the electronic health records. But there are still some policy concerns about doing that more robustly. And so we're, we're uh, for, for, especially for research purposes, those are, those are kept separate at the moment. And uh, my, I, I think this is an area that uh, for policy, ripe for policy development, because uh, certainly um, genomics is very important for our health. And so having us understand genomics along with our health outcomes and electronic health records, for example, could be quite powerful. But there are still very robust uh, concerns about privacy and protecting people's privacy in terms of, of genomics. And so I think that there, those protections are there for a reason. Um, but I think how we understand how we can work with those protections and still make sure that we can navigate our way through the necessary research that's needed to help uh, to better our health. I think that's an important area. Gary? Yeah. Um, so w one area, I guess, that would give me some concern uh, almost relates to my previous comment that uh, once you, as a non-geneticist, once you kind of get beyond that sort of Mendelian and start to get into complex traits that are clearly dynamic gene environment kind of interactions that create a, a potential disease phenotype, that complexity of interpretation such that just because you have the DNA sequence uh, from that patient probably doesn't really tell you enough about the whole lived experience of that individual to then make a synthesis as a clinician, uh, when, again, when you get into complex traits. So uh, the potential to misinterpret us kind of deterministic thing of your code, uh, even if you got it from Ancestry.com. Uh, and I obviously particularly worry about that uh, as it relates to different ancestral groups uh, in which certain patterns of, of variation uh, might get misinterpreted uh, in ways and simplistic analyses uh, to say what your intelligence is going to be, what your future opportunities are going to be, all those sorts of things. So if there was a, a downside of, you know, of the interpretation of all the sequence data uh, that's not holistic and integrative, that, that would worry me. Over. I have two concerns. The first one is privacy, privacy, privacy. And remember that your genome sequence is not uniquely yours. So let's say someone leaves a laptop on a subway train and someone can hack into your medical records or your genome sequence. That's information that is also going to be related to your siblings, your parents, your children, et cetera. So that's quite different from someone having access to a chest x-ray, for example. The second concern I have is particularly in the prenatal area, because so little of the human genome has been annotated for fetuses and young children. And that's really important, because people will make irrevocable decisions based on what they're told. And what we're learning is that 
um, you know, the phenotype for some of these well-known single gene Mendelian disorders presents quite differently in the prenatal period. And that what we see as pediatricians really represents a more extreme phenotype. So historically, we might counsel prospective parents based on what we saw in a very extreme setting. When we just have the genome and no apparent phenotype in the fetus, we, we really need to broaden that phenotype. So I have concerns about that and how that information is going to be used. I can uh, be quick with this. I'll just echo everything that everyone has said here, and uh, privacy being huge, and certainly that's a really foundational thing with all of us and our participants, our trust and transparency with what we do and how we protect data. But uh, I want to say a little bit more about clinical uh, interpretation and use. I, I think um, I think we all uh, have probably clinically seen scenarios or heard about scenarios in which you know VUSs has have been interpreted as pathogenic, and that has really very real in real consequences for a, a given patient. Um, and clarity of that, and how do you take these complex things, if you think of pharmacogenetics, you know, star one and star two and star 17 are all dramatically different in terms of their interpretation for, you know, CYP2C19. These details don't matter, but the, um, uh, you know, but the details do all matter. And, and how do the providers, how do you make that transparent for the providers so they can do the right thing with the patient in front of them, seamlessly easy within a very short encounter? Um, uh, and that's one thing I, I fear as, as this comes out. And then the lack of diversity in genomics has such profound implications in that clinical interpretation, in the clinical care guidelines that we can deliver and make a difference uh, with our patients. Well, as I suspected was going to happen, time just flew by. So I had more things I would love to spend time asking you, but the program doesn't allow that. But I will just say... Fire the moderator. Uh, yeah, that may be it. Um, but no, no, this was all really incredibly interesting and fun. So um, I, thanks to Josh, Diana, Joni, Gary for sharing your valuable time with us and to really set up the day. I think it's been very clear um, from even this discussion how incredibly impactful genomics has been. And we're going to continue this theme as we go on the rest of the day. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm supposed to, well, we're setting, oh yeah, we're, uh, th this is now the part where I basically say that uh, while we're setting up for the next panel, um, we're going to have a little teaser video. So in honor of the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project, the NHGRI History Program and I invited leadership from the Human Genome Project, known as the G5, to reflect on their experiences leading what was the world's largest scientific endeavor ever attempted at the time in biomedical research. So we captured this discussion, which is going to be released fully in May, but I wanted to give all of you a special sneak preview of this historic conversation. So please roll the video. I'd be curious to hear in like one word or one phrase how each of you believe you are characterized or how did you behave on those calls? So Richard, I'm gonna start with you. How do you think you were, what was your persona during most of those interactions? I find that almost impossible to answer. Um, but I can tell you that um, one person at one moment told me I was the nice guy in the genome project and another person within an hour in my local environment told me what an a-hole I was. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what do you think your persona was? Oh, I'd like to think that I was the reasonable one in the room. Jane, what you about you? I felt that I was you know, sort of the face of, of the people who were actually doing the work at the Sanger. I'm a listener, so I did a lot of listening. I'll be curious if Bob or others have a thought. What, what was John Salston's persona? Excitable when there was an issue to discuss. Bob, do you agree with that? Yeah, he certainly, he, he had his buttons. <laughs> Eric Lander, how were you, how, what do you think your persona was? 
Well, I'm, I'm going to go with excitable and stubborn, which I would agree that John also was excitable and stubborn. And Bob was the reasonable one. Ari, what about you? What was your persona? Uh, I was pretty stressed out because of some of the internal DOE problems that were very unique to me that you had absolutely no idea, perhaps even more difficult than what I had expected. So that's my persona. Okay. And Michael, were you on many of these calls? What was your persona? I think everybody would agree. I was Mr. Nice. Okay. <laughs> you still are. <laughs> All right. Well, that then leaves just Francis. Francis, what was your persona? Um, I hope I wasn't excitable, but I was excited about the science. And I think mostly I was an optimistic peacemaker because we were all on the line, of course. <laughs> this was not a place where failure was an option.